All right, we're going to let the fun begin. Uh, welcome to this panel. I'm Carlos Watson. I am uh, I'm pleased to be your moderator today. We have uh, four fantastic people. Um, I will start uh, at the far end with Louise Rogers. Uh, she's the CEO of a company called TSL uh, in the UK and uh, one of my favorite CEOs of all time. Uh, if you don't know C uh, TSL, you'll learn a little bit about it today, a uh, broad network of several million teachers. Uh, finding jobs and sharing lesson plans, and also doing something very interesting with American unions. Um, governor, uh, I, I sometimes want to call him governor, sometimes want to call him senator, sometimes want to call him university president. Um, I think all fit, also entrepreneur. Uh, Bob Carey, uh, who many of you know, uh, served as governor and senator uh, of Nebraska and subsequently served 10 years um, as the president of the uh, New School uh, in New York, so brings all sorts of, of interest to the conversation. Um, as far back as, uh, as 1968, Mort Kondrak, he started writing about all sorts of things. Um, and uh, as we talked early on, before there was the famous 1983 report, A Nation at Risk, uh, which talked about the challenge facing American schools, uh, Mort was already on the case and writing about it. So comes to today's conversation um, filled not only with ideas, but with perspective. Uh, and then Adam Frankel, um, uh, President Obama has been lauded by both sides as being one of the more forward thinkers on the question of education. Um, uh, in fact, Mort's got an interesting uh, perspective on that today. And one of the people who helped the president craft his thoughts and lay them out carefully was Adam, who was one of the president's main speech writers. Uh, subsequently was chosen to head a bipartisan group uh, called Digital Promise, and now is in the uh, process of uh, writing a book. I wonder whether or not the president should be nervous, but we'll find out not, about about him. not at all okay we'll find out about more of that today but we are going to have a good and spirited hardball conversation um, about where education is today several of the hot button issues and where it can move um, and where it can move tomorrow but I always like to start these conversations by trying to understand why these people are on the stage in the first place and what drew them to the conversation so Adam I'm going to start with you uh, you spent a fair amount of time in politics um, but now find yourself uh, spending a good deal of time in education. Uh, why? What drew you to this? Personal? Accidental? Is there a particular calling? Why are you here in this conversation? So um, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you for uh, having me. Um, so I, I guess the reason I'm here, as Carlos indicated, I mean, I, I, uh, I was a speechwriter for the president for about four and a half years, second speechwriter hired on his campaign in 2007. Um, and I had the uh, opportunity, the privilege to work with him on a number of his uh, education speeches. I mean, I, you know, as a speechwriter for president, you work on all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, it, you know, primary night speeches and auto restructuring speeches and economy, all kinds of stuff. But I also um, volunteered for a lot of the education speeches because it was an area that I cared about. It was an area that I thought the president um, had a very strong uh, record and, and vision on. Um, and so, I worked with him on a lot of those speeches over the course of those four and a half years where he laid out his uh, uh, education reform agenda from um, race to the top uh, and beyond. Uh, and while I was working on those speeches, uh, you know, after several years, uh, I, I really felt that I didn't only want to write uh, about education uh, anymore. I wanted to help actually enact um, some of the president's vision and, and what I thought was right on the ground. Uh, and so it was around that time that uh, the administration was launching what had actually been authorized under President Bush, um, which was Digital Promise, uh, um, a 501c3 uh, chartered by Congress to spur innovation in education with technology. Uh, and they needed somebody to get it off the ground, and so I volunteered to do that. Um, and uh, it uh, has been an extraordinary experience, and we brought together um, school districts around the country 32 now in 21 states that serve two and a half million kids that have committed to pilot, evaluate, and then scale up um, uh, innovations that are working and delivering results for kids. So my, the reason I'm here is, is because I was drawn into education by President Obama, but decided to make a commitment uh, afterwards to help make a difference on the ground. And, and Mort, I gave away a little bit of, uh, I gave away a little bit of your story, but, but why did you start writing about education uh, as early as you did at the time you were you began writing about it, there certainly were a lot of other things you could have been talking about in that, uh, those late Carter, early Reagan years. Um, well, you, <clears throat> I, I actually can't 
answer the, I mean, I'm basically a political journalist, and, um, and so, but you develop certain specialties for odd reasons, and I just always cared about education and understood that it needed reform and started writing about it, and once you start writing about it, you can't stop writing about it because you're always sort of absorbing things. I'm, you know, I, I'm interested in healthcare as well. And, um, and there are other things that, you know, that are sort of secondary that, um, which I won't get into. But, you know, so, so you have your themes and you just keep on it. And that's, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting rut that I've worn into a canyon. <laughs> <laughs> and my, and in, in addition to that, my wife, Marguerite, who's being one of the people being honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award, has spent her life in education. So when, when we got married, you know, we, I've been, uh, I like to say, strategic advisor to America's Promise, which is America, uh, Colin Powell's youth organization. Um, and uh, so that's kept, sustained it. And, uh, and Governor Kerry, you, uh, after your, uh, your terms in the Senate, obviously had plenty of choices and, and decided, um, you kind of did the reverse of, uh, of General Eisenhower who, uh, uh, and, and, and President Wilson, who both were presidents of universities and then, and then ran uh, for office. You, you served in office and then, and then took on the job of running a university. What has drawn you to education so deeply? Well, it's actually, there's some overlap with, with Mork. I mean, I, I was uh, elected governor in, in 82, uh, and of course, Nation of Risk came out in 83, so it was a dominant area of concern uh, for the whole four-year uh, period that I was governor, and it was a dominant area of concern the whole time I was in the Senate for 12 years. Spent a, a lot of time, particularly with education and technology. We, in Nebraska, created the first uh, uh, online K-12 through school, class.com, in the 1990s. Um, another way of saying it, other than directly, my university messed it up, but, but it was a good idea at the time. Um, and so I've had a lot of experience, uh, but I, I said yes to running a, a university because I fell in love with a woman who wouldn't marry me unless I agreed to have a baby, and I didn't want to have another child and raise him in politics, and she <laughs> lived in New York City, and I got a job offer in New York City and said yes. So it wasn't like there was a lot of due diligence and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the process. So. Um, but I care deeply about it, and uh, I, I, I think the, particularly in higher education, which is uh, the governance of higher education is much, much easier than K through 12. Um, I, I, it's one of the great success stories in the United States. It's, it's, uh, it's had starts and fits and plenty of challenges and problems, but it's radically decentralized, very competitive, uh, and uh, it's a great success story. But uh, I do think that the that the work, at least the, the, the presentations that I've heard uh, since coming to this conference, um, I think that a lot of the, the activity that's going on in the private sector really is gonna help uh, both higher education and uh, uh, K-12 uh, do a much better job, hopefully at a lower cost. And Louise, what about you? You spent an initial career as a, a journalist and editor and then found yourself in the ed world. Uh, was that accidental, purposeful? How did that happen? Um, it wasn't um, purposeful at all, actually. So I was uh, approached by a private equity company and said, how do you fancy going and uh, looking at this really old British company? I was working in San Francisco. I was having a lovely time running a rock and roll music media uh, company, uh, sitting on the bay, having a great uh, blast. <laughs> and uh, the idea of going back to London in December and um, running a very old-fashioned business, which was all print publications and should have been dead um, and should have definitely died in the next 10 years if you didn't do something was, you know, uh, I had mixed emotions about that. But it was an amazing challenge. And it was a, a business, the TES, which was known in the UK for teachers forever. Um, even my mum had heard of it and uh, we had nothing to do with education. So it was a great challenge. And then when I got there, I found uh, a couple of things. One was that I didn't feel, feel the company really was part of the education system. It, was, uh, it, it made quite a lot of money out of the education system, but it hadn't really, as a company, become part of that. And, it, and I felt very strongly that it should do that. And I think it also started to speak to me in terms of uh, what education really meant. Um, and I had been very lucky to have an incredibly good education, a publicly funded education in the UK. Um, and my, uh, my children have very good educations. And it, and it was very clear 
that that was not the case for uh, a huge number of people. So I wanted the company to not only prosper and do well and become digital and all those things, but actually make a difference. Um, Adam, let's turn to you first as we talk about the politics of education, because you got to see it up close and personal um, uh, with the president. How difficult was it for him during those first four years to usher in significant changes like race to the top um, and, and some of the others? Or was the financial setting such that, uh, you know, that compared to some of the challenges of, say, George W., um, this president had an easier time? Um, well, I guess I'd answer that in a couple ways. I mean, it, part of what um, allowed uh, him, I think, to be uh, successful to the extent one considers his record a success um, uh, was by taking the sort of bottom-up approach um, that was encouraged through Race to the Top, uh, through the Common Core. Uh, so rather than sort of saying, laying out some sort of, uh, uh, you know, national uh, program, uh, it was very much working with states um, individually to, to uh, develop uh, from the grassroots uh, um, the sort of education reforms that were aligned with his vision. Um, so I think that was, that was, that was important. Uh, I do think that, you know, one, one issue that we didn't write a lot about, frankly, uh, was technology. I mean, he's increasingly talked about that, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a few lines here or there. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that, I think. Um, but what, I, what I've seen as I've gotten more and more involved in the sort of education technology work uh, is the way in which that, as much as any other aspects of education, are a real um, place where bipartisanship can be possible. <coughs> I think there are some risks associated with that. It may not always be that, that way. Um, we can talk about that. But I do think that, that it, um, um, innovation education and education as a whole remains one of the few areas um, where some sort of bipartisan agreement can still be possible. So, so be even more specific. What one or two things could happen in these next three or four years uh, um, that you think would be big, significant, have a real impact on America's K-12 education system? Well, one thing I would like to see happen uh, is another round of um, the race to the top district. Um, I mean, I think that um, part of what we have, part of what we saw recently with the um, with the Race to the Top District program was a focus on personalization, a focus on technology and innovation. And I think that as the Department of Education um, uh, considers the uh, success uh, and uh, sort of results of that uh, effort, um, that they will um, do another round of that. Uh, and I think it, it's a powerful way of driving forward um, personalized learning at the district level um, in, in districts across the country. And just a quick check, uh, how many of you are familiar with Race to the Top? I don't want to be presumptuous, so, um, okay, okay, great. Uh, Mort, you surprised me uh, when we talked uh, beforehand, uh, kind of in your, the way you looked at Obama's first four years and, 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 and how Republicans have reacted to that. Can you, can you replay that uh, for sure. us, kind of how you evaluate <clears throat> Obama on education and just as significantly where Republicans have been and, and where maybe they should be or are going? Well, in the, in the very beginning of the administration when, uh, when Arne Duncan and <clears throat> the president invented Race to the Top, there was a bipartisan consensus about it. It was, it was one of the few things that, that there was a consensus about. Um, as time went on, I'm afraid that, uh, that education policy uh, got as polarized uh, or almost as polarized as lots of other things in, in, in Washington. Um, when they, um, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was up for reauthorization, <clears throat> um, there were drafts after drafts, and they could, could never get a, a, an agreement on a, on a bill to reauthorize the, <clears throat> the act. And so what Arne Duncan did was to essentially um, change, the, change No Child Left Behind through waivers to, to various states one at a time <clears throat> with, with the Republicans complaining a lot. Um, the, uh, so <clears throat> always in the past, you know, the, the, there was an education reform gang that was Lamar Alexander and Diane Ravitch and all those people who, who back in the, in the George H.W. Bush administration who were always talking about standards, accountability, testing, all of that kind of stuff. 
Um, along comes Barack Obama, and he believes in standards, accountability, testing, and, and all that stuff. So the minute he, he becomes, he goes in there as a reformer, the Republicans are all, start, all start saying, oh, no, 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 let's not have national standards. Let's not force the common core curriculum on the, on the states and all that. Let's have localism. You know, they've always been hostile to the teachers' unions, and yet, where do the teachers' unions have the maximum power but at the state, at the local, state and local level? So I th I've been saying that there's an unholy, unacknowledged alliance between the Republicans in Congress and the teachers' unions. And, um, and to the extent that you, know, you had during the Republican primaries, these uh, candidates were all saying how they were going to do away with the U.S. Department of Education and return the business of education to the state and local level. Fortunately, that's never happened, <clears throat> but um, it, it, it is still controversial. And all you have to do is look at the proposal about early childhood. Um, the Republicans are all denouncing it at they, they, the Wall Street Journal editorial page, which, by the way, I wish, wish somebody in this community would respond to. Um, they say, you know, the, the Republican line is that Head Start's a failure, uh, it's been proved, therefore early childhood is a boondoggle, and let's forget about it. <clears throat> and I think the president's gonna have a very difficult time getting that, his $75 uh, billion 10-year program, is it? Through, through Congress, um, bec uh, through the House of Representatives. Bob, so, so <clears throat> how, how do you see it, and what would you, how would you guide President Obama, who, uh, who may have a really interesting opportunity here during this second term, assuming that there's some bipartisanship around immigration, assuming there's ultimately some bipartisan success, um, uh, uh, unfortunately and fortunately in some ways around uh, the gun issue. Um, uh, how would you guide the president to, to approach the education issue? What one, two, or three things would you want to see him make a priority? Well, I mean, first of all, I'd probably stipulate not to take my advice since uh, I lost the presidential campaign and he won. So, um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, giving advice from afar to somebody who's actually in the, in the, uh, in the seat having to make these decisions all the time is a, is a very, very common activity. I always like, it looks really easy sitting here in Phoenix. Um, look, I, I, I think generally what he's trying to do is right. We, we are, we're, well, I'm 69 years old. Mort, I don't know how old Mort is. He's probably 65, whatever it is. We're not the future. Um, and right now we're investing more and more in Mort and I. Um, in Social Security and Medicare. That's what we're doing, because we vote 80%. And 20-year-olds don't vote. Um, so we're not investing in them. $300 per year, kids under five. They sure as hell don't vote. Um, so we're investing more and more and more in people over the age of 65. Uh, 20 million military retirees, TRICARE is $485 a year. Um, How much? Uh, $485 a year. It's $55 billion total annually. Um, and we're, what the president's talking about doing is taking some of the mineral management money and putting it into uh, early child ed education. It's unlikely he's going to get it done, uh, in part because of ideological opposition, but mostly because the money's already committed with no debate. We're not going to have a debate about whether or not we should spend $60 billion more this year than last on Medicare and Social Security. The president's proposed relatively modest change in COLA. The left opposed it. The Wall Street Journal editorialized against it. Um, I mean, that's the fundamental problem. More and more of the budget's going to people over the age of 65. We're turning it into an ATM machine uh, because they vote and they raise holy hell. I'm a member of the Reserve Office Association. I got blown up in Vietnam, so I get their circulars all the damn time. Uh, and they're saying, I don't care whatever else happens. We want to protect TRICARE. We want to protect our pensions and, and protect our benefits. And that's the problem. That's what the president faces. And it's not just him. Uh, I mean, the, the Republicans have the same darn problem. The Republican, the, the Republic, Republican Congressional Campaign Committee leader indicated that he's going to use the president's proposal on Social Security to try to win seats in the, in the midterm election. And he probably will win seats in the midterm election as a consequence. So that's the challenge. The real challenge is, do we really believe that our children are our future or not? And if you look at our budget right now, it seems to be that we believe that people over the age of 65 are our future because that's where all the money's going. Other than that, I don't feel strongly about it. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 uh, Louise, the, uh, the senator who doesn't feel strongly about it uh, uh, leads us into an interesting place, which is a world in which governments um, 
uh, I don't want to say government's ability, but government's likeliness to, to drive big changes, uh, uh, smart moves like race to the top notwithstanding, which, which, which used a limited amount of money to, to affect large change, may mean that, that private companies become more important. Um, the private companies are going to have to deal uh, with unions in many cases in, in, uh, in trying to implement something. And you've had a rare opportunity to, uh, to see what that's like up close and personal. You've struck an unusual deal with the uh, uh, American Federation of Teachers yes. um, to work as your partner. So can you briefly tell us a little bit about how you're working together and then give us the real nitty gritty because it, it would be easy to think that, that that's nirvana, that, that private and public or private and union could work together. But has it been easy and is it replicable or do you guys, are you guys doing something that is likely to be a one-off for I a think, while? I think I mean, we have a 50-50 joint venture with the American Federation of Teachers. We have, it's a proper company. Uh, we run a uh, website called Share My Lesson which allows teachers to share resources. And it's a really unusual deal. Um, uh, American labor unions do not do commercial joint ventures with private sector companies, let alone Brits, let's be honest. So uh, <laughs> that, was, uh, that was quite a sales story. Um, and, and I had met Randy, I had heard about Randy Weingarten who, who heads up the AFT. I'd never met her until we started talking about potentially doing something together. And I can tell you, the people who had the biggest problem with this was the lawyers. So that took six months because the art, you know, what happens all the lawyers want to know if, you know, we make money in a way that the AFT doesn't want, or the AFT does something that embarrasses our brand, or we do something that embarrasses the AFT brand. And once you got through all of that, and, it, and that was driven, getting through that was driven by Randy and I saying, we don't care, we want to get it done, we want to make something happen. Um, I have monthly board meetings with the AFT and with Randy, and I'm going for one on Friday. We talk every week and we are culturally about as far apart as you can get and in another way we are completely aligned in trying to get this thing built and done and putting teachers at the center of it in terms of the nitty-gritty there are some funny moments i mean you know trying to sort out the terms and conditions for the staff of the joint venture i'm going how much holiday do you get <laughs> and she's going what's this bonus thing and uh, uh, you know we have interesting debates and and you have to um you have to compromise actually uh, and you have to put your uh, ideologies to one side and try and figure out something that works and uh, and i'm finding it's incredibly helpful because you know we are a very driven business orientated company everything has a target everything has a um uh, a measurement and people are measured against things and to start with that was difficult we'd send through the targets for this week and the aft would say we don't we don't we don't really like doing it that way and we go hey look our teams they'll go to sleep unless we give them a target they just don't <laughs> like it um and so we got through that and then if we put if we think about content the AFT is thinking about the quality of that content and the use of the common core state standards. Um, and you know, it's really hard work from both sides and both sides work really hard on it. And I think if we can make it work and if private and, uh, uh, sector could work more with the unions, it's a wonderful thing actually, because you start breaking through those barriers um, and, and you start not talking about politics but about what the thing you're trying to achieve. And to be clear, for those who don't know, what you're talking about is a network in which several million teachers, a teacher who's up at 10 p.m. in Atlanta um, and trying to figure out how to teach the Pythagorean theorem tomorrow, um, could try and uh, bone up herself or himself, or they can go online within your network, find another teacher who teaches a similar course, who already has put together all this work, download her or his lesson plan, and therefore hopefully <laughs> show up the next day at work and teach a much more impactful class. Um, whether it's on English or math or social studies or science. And it's the ability to share those lessons is what you were doing, not only for the AFT teachers, but for other teachers who aren't in the Yes, there's about two and a half million teachers on that now, and they, it, they join at a rate of about 20,000 a week, and that's them finding the site and coming together. And when you think about that, I mean, that could be very threatening to any union because that's teachers coming together and doing stuff without being organized and without signing up, without paying any dues. I mean, that's a completely different sort of community. Um, you know, I, I take my hat off to Randy and the union for see, saying, actually, we want to understand that and we want to um, really help those teachers do that. 
Bob, how much, uh, um, how, what was your experience working with unions uh, as governor and then your interaction subsequently in the Senate um, and even at the higher ed level as president of the university? Did you, you know, is the experience that Louise is recounting sound like one that could be replicable going forward in a world of, of some scarcity, as you pointed out, um, um, or does it sound like a one-off? Oh, no, I think it can be absolutely replicated. But, but Louise, yeah, first of all, any management um, uh, position uh, working with, with a union, there's, there's going to be cultural conflicts. But you've got to create an environment where you can negotiate out those cultural conflicts and have a compromise. I mean, I've, uh, I've had my fights with unions, uh, but um, I don't, I don't I, I, if you ask me, are the unions the problem in education? I don't think they are. I don't think they're a central problem. I mean, there are things that they want to do that, that, uh, 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 that, that I disagree with that I think are a problem. But I don't think the, the fact that there's a union inside your organization means that your organization can't make progress and can't continue to improve. Right? So I've, I would say have a relatively good, uh, my union might disagree with that assertion, um, but I think I have a very good, I had a very good relationship with, with, with the union, particularly at the new school. Adam, of all the things you saw both during your time in the White House and uh, at Digital Promise, what are two or three of the best bright spots? Not that I want to live on anecdotes, but yeah. what are two or three you think of, of the best and most important bright spots um, that you saw in the education landscape that may really suggest any real chance at, at major change, particularly for failing schools? So um, I'll, I'll give you a couple, but I also want to just build on what's being talked about here because I think this is a really important issue. It's also. Um, very much in line, I think, with, with some of the, um, um, what this summit is about, and that is the, the sort of role, increasing role of private sector in, in, um, in education and technology. I mean, we, we um, confronted this issue a lot, and I, do, and I think that, uh, and that is uh, the issue of um, how to sort of navigate those lines between public school districts um, and, and companies. I mean, the, the, w one of the things that I found was that when it comes to education technology, it's, it's a narrative and it's a topic that doesn't frequently um, break through in the national media. Um, uh, to the extent it has over the course of the past year or two, um, it's often been um, rather negative. Uh, and, um, and it's often focused on the role of uh, private sector. Uh, and, um, and there's, I think, a fear uh, that uh, the, you know that when you mix private sector and um, who are more interested in their profits and than kids uh, um, that that's jeopardizing the students and the schools and so what what I found is that that um, obviously some of the most innovative work is happening in, in companies with entrepreneurs um, but the, those relationships have to be navigated and constructed responsibly and properly um, and um, that is that's clearly one of the risks here especially as the governments are increasingly cash strapped at the local level and, and federal. Um, uh, and and uh, companies are actually creating some of the more innovative work. I mean, so uh, that, that's one of the major challenges, I think, that uh, this sort of field has to wrestle with. Um, but in terms of bright spots, um, there are a whole bunch. I mean, we, as I mentioned, we've got 32 districts in our League of Innovative Schools um, in 21 states. And there are a whole number of those um, that are just doing extraordinary stuff. Some of them have gotten recognition in the community. Uh, for example, Mooresville, North Carolina, led by Mark Edwards, who some of you may be familiar with, um, uh, who had a, um, uh, who's gotten written up in a bunch of national publications about the work he's done. He's boosted graduation rates um, as he's undergone his digital conversion. But there are plenty of others. There's a um, superintendent in Utica Community Schools in Michigan, which is in Macomb County, uh, hard hit by the um, recession. Um, who's doing a blended learning model uh, in kindergarten, which is um, incredibly popular with her with her teachers. Um, we've got a district in um, in Alabama um, where they don't have running water or electricity in some places there uh, in their in their community um, that uh, had for a time uh, that 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 was given laptops to its kids was running a summer virtual school to help curb the summer learning loss. Um, so there there are amazing stories happening all over. Uh, uh, is the truth. Now the research is often uneven uh, and new about the results of education technology. Um, but anecdotally, what we're hearing uh, constantly from teachers and, and educators uh, uh, is the sort of power uh, of the technology in these places. 
Hey, Morton, I want to do a little bit of a, a Rorschach test here with you. I want to give you a couple <laughs> of, uh, of recent events and, and get uh, your take, your observation, how you, how you think about these. Uh, one was the uh, cheating scandal in Atlanta um, recently where the uh, former superintendent uh, was charged with, uh, um, with leading a number of uh, teachers and principals in, um, in, uh, in, in faking the numbers uh, on tests. And then two, I want to ask you how you looked upon and thought about this standoff in Chicago last uh, summer um, uh, around there. And those are, you know, again, a little bit of Rorschach here, but, but, but two significant, I think, meaningful things as we think about uh, significant change in the education uh, sector going forward. Well, <coughs> there's, a, there's, you know, uh, we're, we assume that uh, we, we give the, the Atlanta um, uh, chargees, those charged uh, with the benefit of the presumption of innocence. Um, I mean, what, if you, I don't know whether there's a, a, an, over, an overly aggressive prosecutor in this case, because the treatment of some of these teachers and some of the, the administrators is downright uh, Giuliani-esque, you know, um, treating them like, like felons. Um, so I, I'm not sure that, that, uh, that what, what is, how strong his case is, but <clears throat> what it, it is a setback for the idea of testing. I mean, you just read Diane Ravitch and the, the teachers unions are dead set against, you know, high stakes testing. And so this Atlanta scandal suggests that testing is so high stakes that these teachers and, and principals felt they had to cheat on these tests in order to get, get their rewards, get their, their, their pay increased, and, and the, the whole business of accountability is held suspect because of, because of this case, because of the cheating. I mean, I think it, it, is, it is a setback to, the, to accountability if the case is, is, is proved. Um, it shouldn't be that way. Um, I mean, I don't think that teaching to the test is such a bad idea. I mean, if, if uh, and I don't think, and I don't, and I don't know how you can assess without, without testing. Um, and everybody, everybody tests everything all the time and outcomes are important in every field in the, in the, in the world um, outside of education and, uh, and healthcare probably. Um, there's, it was still a big problem in healthcare. Um, so that's, that's my Rorschach test. So I, I frankly, I hope, I hope that the Atlanta case is, is prosecutorial excess and not legitimate, you know, legitimate cheating, but who knows? And Bob, and what, was the, what was the second uh, one? Uh, oh, Chicago. oh, Chicago. Chicago. Yep. Oh, <clears throat> so Karen Lewis, I'm a, I'm a Dartmouth trustee, and Karen Lewis is a graduate of Dartmouth College, and it embarrasses me, frankly, that that she's a that she's a she's a, she's a leader. She's of the, the she is the AFT oh. um, uh, president, and I think she'd like to be Randy's um, successor, and she is a she is a militant, um, and so. Um, Closing schools or trying to get pensions under control is anathema, and she has managed. She's a she is fighting Rahm Emanuel, who is a master politician, and so far as I can see, beating him um, in the public relations game, which is really remarkable. Um, in so far as he's got a much stronger case than she does, you know, the fact is that there are charter schools in Chicago, and the charter parents are sending their kids to the charter schools because they're better and um, therefore there are fewer people going to the public schools and the budget cannot sustain this, this as many schools as there are. So Rahm wants to close the, pub, the public schools that, that are under undermanned. Um, and it, you sort of got to do it. Um, now, if the, te you know, if the teachers unions would permit uh, reforms and would um, uh, weren't so weren't so industrial era bound. Maybe they would improve to meet the standards and reattract the, um, um, the the students back to the schools, and you wouldn't have to close as many. Uh, but um, that's but that's the case. So you know, I think I'm definitely on Rom's side in that one. 
Um, Bob, I'd love to give you a bite on it, and then I'm going to go to the audience for, for questions. So if you have questions, you should, uh, you should prepare to raise your hands, and we'll, if we need mics, we'll have, we have mics that will come. Bob, how, how, do you, how do you think about those, those two recent uh, Well, I mean, recent look, first of all, I mean, the, 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 the K-12 through classroom is the most heavily, heavily regulated environment in America. And, and, it's, and there's been, it's not just the teaching union that opposes these high-stakes tests. It's, it's parents and at the community level. And it's, a, it's, it's a heavily regulated environment. And, uh, and, and trying to turn it uh, uh, back perhaps to this audience, uh, if you think about a, 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 you know, a, a 12 or 13-year-old, uh, they're awake about 4,000 hours a year. Well, by law, they've got to be in school 1,000. Otherwise, so they're a status offender, and they go in the juvenile justice system. Other than that, you know, we don't encourage them very strongly to go to school. Uh, so they get 1,000 hours in the school. What, what I find exciting about the, 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 the presentations that I've set to, and I apologize, uh, I, I'm going to miss some of them, but is, is a lot of the attention is directed for that 3,000 hours, that they're not in school. And any teacher will tell you, if a child comes to school prepared and ready to learn, they're a lot easier to teach than if they don't. And I, I visited, I just had an unsuccessful campaign from the Senate and maybe visited, I don't know, 25% of our school districts. Every single one, he asked the question, what's the trend line of uh, uh, free and reduced lunch and single parent head of household? The trend line is up in, also, in every single school district. Increasing poverty, increasing number of children with one parent. There's no question that that, that that creates an environment where the child's less likely to come to school ready to learn. And increasingly, teachers are having to be moms and dads. So that 3,000-hour period is a really important period. The, this, the last thing I'd say is that the, the two most exciting presentations I, I heard were, I think, two companies that I don't think either one of them are funded. One of them's Code USA, and the other one's this, uh, this uh, uh, testing one, this, this kid uh, that wrote the software. I'll think of the name of the, the, the company. But they're both approximately the same age as, as high school students. They're maybe four or five years up, up, up older. And they go in the classroom. And they're, and they're saying, we don't sell to the school. We don't sell to the teacher. We're, our market is the student. We're thinking about those students because we know what it's like to be a student. So what, what, what I see going on in the ed tech space today is, that I find to be very exciting, is, is it's, it's spending a lot of time in that 3,000 hours when the, when the, when the student is in school. Uh, and uh, of the reforms that I'd like to see is increasingly, and it's, if those of you who spent time in front of school boards know how treacherous the politics is. It's, if, if you ever want to see democracy's weaknesses, it's, it's at a local school board. It's, it's hard as hell. Uh, uh, I'd like to see more and more of those school boards begin to answer the, uh, ask the question, can we make it possible for the things that are occurring in that 3,000 hours to be relevant to the curricula that we have required for that student inside the classroom? Maybe during that 3,000 hours, they'll start to get credit. Maybe they'll graduate before they, b before they hit 17 or 18. Maybe they'll get out of the school faster. We slow them down, the, board, the school boards oftentimes do. So among the things that I really uh, get the most excited about is working in a non-regulated uh, environment where I think a lot of the ed tech companies, at least at this conference, are. Uh, Louise, actually, before I go to the audience, I'm going to ask you um, something similar to, to, uh, to Senator Kerry. Uh, what excites you the most as you look out um, in terms of fundamentally uh, tipping where education is today? Well, well, clearly from what we're doing, the thing that I'm really involved in and I'm really excited about is this notion of people sharing knowledge. And, and, and we are seeing when we're talking to teachers and we're seeing teachers connect across the globe that actually the education, educational problems that they're coming up against, somebody else has also faced somewhere in the world and quite often, if you can find the person who solved it, the teacher who solved, unblocked that child, got somebody um, working in a certain way, you can do an enormous amount. It's not a silver bullet. It's just about people talking to each other. Now, at the end of the day, that's what you know online did for all our worlds, but it didn't do it for education. And I think we've started to see that come across. Education shouldn't be closed down to the, pe the only people who know how to do it properly and can afford it. Actually, once you start opening that out and you get the kids talking and the teachers talking and sharing experience, it's amazing what there is out there. A couple opportunities. We'll turn to the audience for a couple questions. I see a hand here. Um, this is for Adam Frankel. Yeah, this is for Adam Frankel. Um, over the last 20 years, we've had exemplar schools, a very small percentage, one or two percent, scattered throughout the country where they have performed extraordinarily higher. Than, than other other schools. In Arizona, we have the Wilson District, we have Carpe Diem, we have the, the school in Bales, Arizona. 
Uh, why did why did Digital Promise sort of try to just sort of re replicate that with a few more districts or schools that they're trying new and innovative things? When you had the whole country that needs a transformation, and maybe there's a maybe there's long, larger, bigger systems uh, a focus you could have taken that would actually start making things happen throughout the country. Sure, sure, and no, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, I think he here is our approach. Um, uh, and by the way, I would encourage you uh, to encourage those districts to join the league um, for starters. Um, but, you know, our idea was uh, to uh, bring together uh, some of the most innovative school districts in the country so they could learn from one another. Uh, because, to your point, there are districts all across the country that are and have been doing some extraordinary work. Um, but too often, um, as you can appreciate, I mean, the superintendents and the educators are busy doing their jobs and educating their kids um, and don't often have the time to go out and see what's happening elsewhere or share what they're learning um, with their peers. Um, and so part of the real value and power that we've seen from this group um, has come from the sort of community of practice, the professional development that they offer one another, um, where, where superintendents are learning from one another. Uh, uh, it, it is one thing to hear um, about an innovation at a, uh, from somebody on a panel. Uh, it's one thing to hear a pitch. It's another to hear uh, it from your fellow superintendents, from your fellow teachers. Um, and that really is the power of the group. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, to your point, the, the, the league of innovative schools that Digital Promise has created could grow uh, dramatically by in including everyone. I think um, what we want to do is really build a community of practice so these districts can share with one another what's working and what's not and, and grow it responsibly. Uh, question for both Mort and Bob. Uh, question for both Mort and Bob. Uh, given the strength of the elder lobby, given the strength of the unions, how does this group collectively, the interests represented by those at the conference, how do we influence policy and budget decisions at the federal level especially? Well, I mean, uh, my direct, I mean, I don't worry about it too much. I mean, you're, you're having an impact already. So uh, whatever, whatever it is you're trying to do, and I don't know what the fraction will be, 25% of the companies that, that at this conference will probably succeed and the other 75 won't, but even the ones that don't succeed are going to have an impact. I mean, they're, they're, you're, you're impacting the system as it is. Um, and uh, I, part of what we have to do, uh, uh, the older we get, we have to sort of cure the frustration we have with, with, with the difficulty of getting things done. And because it can get frustrating. And it's, 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 it's an existential part of anybody that's uh, involved with education. You're going to be frustrated. You're never going to be able to get everything done that you want to get done. I mean, you can go long stretches of time without getting anything done. Uh, so you have to have confidence that what you're doing is already having an impact. My own uh, attention is drawn uh, to, the, to the big regulators because they've got to encourage uh, innovation. And specifically, they've got to pay much more attention to outcomes and a lot less attention to inputs. Because if you look at the, if you look at the regulatory requirements, higher ed or K through 12, it's almost all about inputs and very little about, 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 out, you know, about outcome and results. I mean, if, if, if a child, let's say a 12th grader, uh, uh, or take, take a 12 year old, take a seventh grader, over the summer goes online and completes an entire year of, of schoolwork, do they go back into their school and get credit for that schoolwork? Unlikely. It's rare that they do. The regulators have got to start encouraging innovation, as I said, in particular by looking at outcomes, a lot less than inputs. In the higher education environment, because it's a closed system, 4,400 incumbents today, 4,400 incumbents 50 years ago, the last tier one university to be created was Rice in 1913. It's a closed system. We've limited supply. We're increasing demand now $150 billion a year in Pell Grants and other Title IV programs. Price increases going up beyond the rate of inflation. We're shocked. I fell asleep in economics on one, and I know that if you limit supply and increase demand, prices are going to go up beyond the rate of inflation because we compete with more and better buildings, with more inexpensive faculty. And I love faculty, but we're buying more and more expensive faculty to burnish our reputation so U.S. News and World Report will score us well. And the whole iPad system is about expensive inputs. So I, I, mean, I, I think you've got to 
talk in a friendly way, probably less friendly, more friendly than I do when I get worked up, uh, to, to, to both the state and the federal regulators to say, you've got to encourage innovation by measuring results. Who cares how you got to where you are if you achieve success? Uh, I mean, it's the, 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 the joke in, in, in education is, I know it works in practice, but does it work in theory? You could put that down as a slogan for, for most of the regulators. We have to get these regulators to, to encourage innovation that produces ex exceptional results. <clears throat> the regulators are all, you know, in the political system. They are school boards and they're, they're uh, states, state boards of education and so on. Um, and so therefore, it seems to me that the industry, your industry, <clears throat> has, got to, has got to be politically involved. As, as um, um, George Mitchell said on the, first, on the first day here, you got to get to know these people and you got to talk to them. You know, you got to talk to your congressman, you got to talk to um, your, your, obviously you are talking to school boards all the time and especially to superintendents and so on, but uh, they've got to know what's available. I frankly would, <clears throat> would love to see this, uh, this conference, uh, uh, this is an annual event, you know, uh, ASU is the sponsor of it, you're going to have it in, in Phoenix, but, uh, but on off years, I would have something in Washington where you can invite congressional staff and you can invite members of Congress to see what's going on in this field. I have a, I have a feeling that most members of Congress have, haven't the slightest idea how much American education could be improved through, through technology. I mean, they understand, they, they understand the importance of technology in the most important phase of their lives, namely getting reelected. Right, so they, they, they all appreciate what Barack Obama did to get himself reelected using, you know, social media. That they understand. They understand the use of technology for gerrymandering their congressional districts. But do they understand what, what, what American how American education could be transformed by technology? I don't think they do um, over the broad. So I would get to know them and I would, and I would expose them to what is possible. Um, and um, and to, you know talk to everybody up and down the line about about what what it's possible to get done. Uh, we've got time for one last question right here. Oh, um, Adam, um, big believer in digital promise, and I love the concept of these schools applying themselves and committing to innovation. Uh, with that enthusiasm, when you look at the hurdles. Um, the, the biggest ones that you see, you know, the common hurdles uh, with those schools and, you know, doing personalization or uh, differentiated learning, um, you know, there, is it the, the training for the teachers to prepare for that? Is it the access to curriculum that lends itself well to those models? Is it the cost of devices or is it the connectivity? Is there one that stands out? And if there is, what would you see being the near-term solution for that? That's a, no, it's a great question. I mean, we, we've, um, there are a whole variety of challenges, right, that, that uh, all, all of you are very familiar with. Um, but I, I think the ones that continue to uh, emerge are as follows. One is um, actually about school culture. Um, and the superintendents that we've talked to um, who have been most successful have been very successful at cultivating uh, a culture where the teachers are embracing new technologies and willing to, you know, veteran teachers, veteran administrators, and that's hard. Um, you can't just have a provider come in with a bunch of tools and flip the switch, and I mean, it, it takes a lot of work. Uh, number two uh, is around procurement. Um, there are a lot of outdated rules on the books around how districts can procure new technologies um, that are not applicable uh, in an age where um, where we ought to be trying lots of new things and learning from them uh, quickly. Uh, and so we need to work on that. Um, it, so th there are, a, there are a, a whole slew of things. We're doing some of this. I think the biggest thing, though, is risk management. Um, for a lot, of these, uh, um, a lot of these districts, what I think they're looking for uh, is some way of um, uh, making sure that that the, the risk that they're taking by trying new approaches that involve technology is tolerable with their boards, with their other constituencies. 
Um, uh, and so part of what they get from joining the league is that, um, that pointing to other districts that are doing this, um, pointing to an affiliation with an organization like ours that has ties to academic researchers who are evaluating these things. Um, so we're, we're working on some of these issues, um, but there are some very big barriers that I think are gonna continue to stand in the way of the, the progress of the technology, making a real difference. Louise, I'll give you, uh, I'll, I'll let you start the final words and give everyone kind of 30 seconds for any kind of last thoughts or observations to, uh, from today's conversation. I think that for me, it's that everyone's talking about the same thing, which is sharing information um, and, and having an open mind and, and actually smashing some of those walls down. And that's what everybody's talking about. But if everybody walks away from the conference and everything goes back to normal, it's, it's not gonna work. I, mean, I agree. I think Maury had a great idea. It's a terrific conference. It's the first time I've been to it, but uh, it's quite exciting. And, uh, and, and if, if, you know, if 25% of the companies that, that I've listened to are successful, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be huge. The impact's going to be huge. Maury? <coughs> um, well, just a couple of other uh, uh, suggestions. It, it, would, it, it would seem to me that if you can't get through to existing public schools because the rules are so bound up, then you go to charter schools, which can, which are more uh, freewheeling and can make decisions, you know, much easier. And I, you know, I think that charter schools have competition has made all the difference in the world in in um, in education reform. Not all charter schools are great, but that the whole idea of competition is 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 really good. And the the other the other point I would I would suggestion I would make is that is that um, the industry work on getting congressional champions, um, especially Republicans who need to, there's, it would seem to me that, that uh, your entrepreneurs, your innovators, uh, Republicans supposedly love innovation and, and entrepreneurship, right? So um, there, ought to be, there ought to be champions there um, who, and, and you, that's where you need them because they're, because they're, they're the most resistant to um, to uh, to changing things, so I would I would work on them, and you know, and it may be time for the for the industry to have an association or to link itself up with other uh, entrepreneurial minded um, organizations that that do have a presence in Washington to make their case to the members of Congress and their staffs. Adam. Um, well, just building on, on what Mort was saying, I think, I think one of the um, most promising sort of um, overlooked areas uh, and places to sort of try out new things and innovate are, are um, rural uh, and suburban, medium-sized and small districts. Um, because unlike charters, they have, um, uh, charters are sort of their own beasts. Uh, and there's a lot of focus on big urban districts, which for a whole variety of reasons are very difficult. It's very difficult to um, to change uh, um, things quickly uh, within them. Um, but what we found is a lot of small and medium-sized suburban and rural districts, um, there are fewer people to say no uh, to, to new ideas. Uh, and so they can actually move pretty quickly uh, to try new things. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for a uh, fabulous hour. It went quick, big hand for four terrific people.